All right, so let's start the class. I'm going to talk about applications mainly that we have introduced the power spectrum. Uh, but before I go with that, so I'll introduce two, three small topics today. <clears throat> uh, we'll go through uh, one more time match filtering uh, with the colored noise and so spectral factorization. Then I'll talk about Hilbert transforms. As you will see, these are all small applications. So look at this result, uh, look at this problem rather. X of t is a Whitesun stationary Gaussian process, let's say with some autocorrelation function R x x tau. Then we want to show that x of t and uh, x prime t are independent. So obviously there is a differentiator involved. So let's, I, maybe we haven't done this. So let's look at a differentiator. Uh, I mean, this X of T is general X of T. So X of T is uh, input. And this is the output Y of T. It's a derivative. So of course the, uh, derivative of the, I mean, the expected value of the derivative is, uh, remember, this is the operation here. So that's the derivative of the expected value. So that's x of t derivative. So that's going to be mu x prime of t, right? This is mu x of t. So of course, if mu is a uh, constant, if it is a white stationary process, uh, the uh, derivative of the uh, the mean of the output is uh, zero. Remember, output is just the derivative. So this is zero if uh, x of t is white and stationary. I am doing a general case, not necessarily Gaussian. So we'll come to that later. And uh, so then, if you remember, we already looked at R x x. Uh, uh, here y is, so look at the cross correlation function. That's going to be, if you remember, go back a couple of lectures. This is the uh, <coughs> uh, rxx uh, t1 gamma t2. Right. The, uh, the, if you remember that was, in general it was rxx t1 gamma t2 convolved on h of t2, the second uh, 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 operator. So the here the operation is uh, R X X. So you can also you can also do this uh, uh, come uh, because you just use the definition. So this is expected value of X T one X prime uh, T two. So this is D by D two of uh, D uh, D T two right of X of T two and then the dt2 goes outside. So this becomes a partial derivative with respect to xt1, xt2. So that's good. And then similarly, the output, uh, uh, this is, is going to be, uh, so it's the uh, operator acting on the first variable. So you just go through the same thing. So you get rxx prime t1 gamma t2, or it is d squared dt1, dt2, Rxx t1 gamma t2. All right, now suppose x of t is white and stationary. So let's do that case. That means Rxx uh, t1 gamma t2 is Rxx uh, t1 minus t2. So let me substitute that here on the first expression here. So you get Rxx prime. This is the cross correlation function t1 gamma t2 is d by dt2 of, I'm just copying from here, rxx t1 minus t2, okay, because this is white and stationary. So I'm going to call t1 minus t2 to be tau. So dt2 is minus d tau. So I'm going to, so this will be the derivative with respect to minus d tau of rxx tau. So I'm going to write it as rxx derivative tau minus. So this is R X X prime tau. So we know that the process is jointly white and stationary if the input is white and stationary. 
then let me use that here so the output uh, output autocorrelation function i'm is the uh, thing be, uh, acting on the first derivative of r x x prime t1 gamma t2 from here r uh, r x x prime t1 gamma t2 but we just showed that r x x prime t1 gamma t2 is a stationary so it only depends on t1 minus t2 this only depends on t1 i'm going to put t1 minus t2 and i'm once again i'm going to call tau to be t1 minus t2 but this time the derivative is with respect to t1 so d tau is just uh, or dt1 is uh, d tau1 so this becomes d by d tau of r x x prime tau but using the previous graph uh, remember previously we just showed this is r x x prime tau in the previous equation here so if i substitute that here you get this interesting result so this is a useful uh, result so that means the join y uh, the, the output also is wide sense stationary so we get r x prime x prime tau is minus double derivative of r x x tau this is a so what does this say this means that if you have any auto, this is another result you have any autocorrelation function it's a second derivative with a minus sign is a valid autocorrelation function and this is the in other words this autocorrelation is minus uh, d squared by d tau squared of r x x uh, tau this is the autocorrelation function of the, the derivative of the process okay so that much is uh, uh, true but let me bring your attention to this last equation here previous equation rx i'm going to copy this equation and i want to show you something so we have rx x prime tau is minus a derivative of rx x tau i hope you see this this is cross correlation i'm just copying this last line from previous this equation now i am going to manipulate this watch i am going to put uh, uh, where i have tau i am going to replace tau by minus tau everywhere so this becomes r x x prime minus tau is minus d by d of minus tau r x x uh, minus tau so this minus minus goes so you get d by d tau of r x x tau and if x of t is real process uh, i mean r x x minus tau if x of t is real then r x x tau and r x x minus tau are the same so this is simply d by d tau of r x x tau but look at the top equation that's nothing but minus r x x prime tau so you get this so now you bring it to the other side or we have this equation for any white sense stationary process the cross correlation function satisfies this equation okay so this is true for if x of t is white sense stationary uh, then this is true any questions i hope i haven't uh, gone too fast um can you hear me uh, hello can you hear me somebody told yes, me yes professor i can hear you uh, how, how about somebody else is this uh, volume is good yes yes is good yes professor okay so you look at the last equation so let me put the tau equal to 0 in the last equation see what happens so this means if you put the tau equal to 0 here we get two times r x x uh, prime 0 is but that is two times expected value of x of t x prime t equal to 0 so what is the conclusion of this one anybody when two random variables have this property what do you call them hello uncorrelated no not uncorrelated orthogonal right orthogonal.
So here we have x of t and x prime t orthogonal. But look, look at the uh, what is the mean? If x of t is y stationary, what is the mean of x prime? Anybody? I just went through this. What will be the mean of x prime t? Hello? x of t is y stationary. So its mean is constant. That means what? Expected value of x prime t will be? Hello? Look at your slide, equation slide two of uh, sheet one, first page. Remember, this is just the derivative of the mean of x of t, but x of t has constant mean. So what will be this value? Zero. Right. So even if this is not a zero mean, this will be zero. And uh, if they are orthogonal, what can you say about the covariance of x of t and x prime t? Anybody? Covariance is this expected value of x of t, x prime t minus mu x, mu prime x. But this quantity is zero, and we know that this is zero. So covariance is zero. That means x of t and y of t are? Hello? Not x of d, y of, y of t is here the derivative. So what I'm trying to say is if you have a process and any time instant, if you take the x of t and compute its derivative, these two are uncorrelated. And of course, if the process is, if x of t is also Gaussian, then the, remember the derivative is a linear operation. So x prime t is also Gaussian. So if these two are Gaussian, then uncorrelated means they are also independent. That's all I wanted to say. So x of t and x prime t are independent. So this is a useful result if it is Gaussian. Uh, professor, can you give an example of a situation where we might be interested in the derivative of x of t? Yeah, remember if you... Uh, like, for example, uh, the simplest AM receiver uses a derivative, right? Uh, uh, because, uh, or a square law detector, right? That's a square law. Uh, derivative, wherever it comes in. I mean, yeah, remember, derivative is uh, in, in some of the, uh, in, in a, uh, some of the algorithms or in some steps, if you have derivative, uh, so the whole point is, Derivative is uh, of a process is uh, if the process is Gaussian. I mean, if the process is Whitson stationary, then the derivative is I told I just showed you is Whitson stationary. And moreover, its autocorrelation function is minus twice the derivative of the original autocorrelation function. That's what I, I have shown you. So let's also uh, and anyway, this is an additional result. If x of t and x prime t are uh, Gaussian, uh, then uh, uh, if x of t is Gaussian, then x prime t is uh, x of t and x prime t are independent. So if you have a process x of t and you have x prime t, these two random variables are independent. So their joint density function of x and x prime is uh, is of course the product of the density functions. And each are Gaussian, right? So all you need is the mean and variance. So that's going to be, so this is going to be normal with the zero, let's say zero mean and some way variance will be Rxx zero, whereas this will be a zero mean and the variance, I just showed you, variance is the second derivative of Rx with a minus sign, then evaluate it to zero, okay. So et cetera, so you, sometimes this will be useful Especially in that zero crossing problem, if you go back, this will be a this is a useful example. So let me uh, let me move on. I, this was just a warm up. Uh, sometimes this turns out to be uh, so useful. So we have combined Gaussian and the stationarity and the derivative. So the derivative process for every time instant is independent of the original process. 
if the original process is Gaussian. Otherwise, they are uncorrelated. So look at the power spectrum. Remember, a Whitesun stationary process, XFT is Whitesun stationary. So it has got an autocorrelation that depends on a, a tau. So the big theorem was it's a Fourier transform gives us the power spectrum. That's what we learned last week. So I hope you, I asked you to look at the, all the Fourier transform properties. So we'll write it like this, Rxx uh, tau is Sxx omega. So let me see who has uh, studied the Fourier transform. So this is a, this is the Fourier this is the autocorrelation function of uh, of the derivative process. So this is uh, corresponding to x of t. This is corresponding to x prime t. How do you take the Fourier transform of this? This is where the properties will help you. Anyone? So if you know the Fourier transform of the original uh, R x x tau, how do you take? What is the Fourier transform of the second derivative? Anyone? Hello? Someone speak up, let's move on. See you too, do you know? Hello? Anybody knows this? How are you going to do the test next week? I'm going to ask you uh, transform properties and so on. So anyway, this is the transform is minus j squared omega squared sxx omega, but minus j squared is one, so that's omega squared sxx omega. That means the transform, you see, even if sx omega is sort of like this, the derivative process transform is going to blow up because it, it uh, this is omega squared sxx omega. So this is one reason you don't want the derivatives to show up. This is for x of t. So this is the, uh, so derivative is a bad idea because at higher frequencies it blows up. All right, so you should, uh, it'll be useful for you to learn all this. I'm not going to prove all this stuff. Uh, but f, remember, f omega is minus infinity to plus infinity. F t e raised to minus j omega t dt. So if you uh, if you take uh, similarly, f t is uh, yeah. So if you take the derivative of this, you see you get f prime omega is. Remember derivative with respect to omega, so you get minus j omega uh, minus j t f t e raised to minus j omega t d t. So, so you get that this is the so you get another property minus j t f t is uh, the uh, transform is f prime omega, right? And similarly, if you look at the inverse transform, it is Ft equal to, uh, Ft is what? 1 over 2 pi F omega e raised to J omega T D omega. So I take the derivative here. I get uh, 1 over 2 pi uh, I get to J omega, right? J, uh, remember the, I am sorry. Yes, j omega, because I'm taking the derivative with respect to t on both the sides. So j omega, f omega, e raised to j omega, t d omega. So this is the transform of f prime t. So if you take the derivative again, you can see that this will get squared. And that's what I did there, j squared. That's what I wrote here in the previous slide, right? So you need to go and uh, do all this. So f, f prime tau transform is j omega squared uh, f of omega, etc. So use these uh, properties. This I will use in a minute when we discuss the, the something else later. So I, I hope you see how I have done this. Right. 
So Fourier transform is a big step and I'm going to uh, ask you to, uh, because ne next quiz is going to be, I'm going to give you something like this. This is from my notes. Maybe some of this is already in the uh, uh, homeworks, etc. So I'm going to go through this and I'm going to give you a simple problem that you can do. But if you come to the exam without practicing anything, then you are not going to do it. So you need uh, just uh, try to develop uh, some skills. And now if you can't do this between now and next week, then I will, I have the solutions here. I just did it all myself. I can, we can go over, but I'm not going to give you the solution for you to look at it. I want you to do it. In the past, I have asked problems of this type in the exam also. And one of, you probably can expect a problem in the final exam. So these are a little more difficult, the last one. So you need to spend a little bit of time at home, uh, maybe a lot of time. Uh, Look at the last one. Uh, I gave you a function. I'm saying find the value of phi for which this will be a valid autocorrelation function. That means, remember, if it is a valid autocorrelation function, the spectrum should be positive. So you use, you find the value of transform and see for what value of phi the spectrum will be positive. Only when you sort of try to do these problems yourself, you will, uh, so here there are four problems. Just do it. I hope you can copy it. Maybe some of them are already in the homework. Uh, these are easy, but uh, some, I mean, here you, as I said, you have to sort of manipulate. But if you do this, so how much more can I, I mean, yeah, as I said, at some point you have to own it and start doing the, uh, doing some of these things uh, yourself. Because after all, this is a graduate course and I assume you came here to learn something, right? So please try this and uh, actually I, I think uh, almost all of the, I don't remember exactly, but I do have lectures on Fourier transforms on YouTube and all these are solved there, I think. So you all you have to do is look at it and then try to solve it yourself or solve it yourself and then look at it, etc. So let me move on with the next topic. So last time we were uh, looking at uh, match filter. So remember, this is now we are on the practical problems. This is the uh, usually the problem. Signal plus noise is coming. ST plus NT. So let me uh, understand the problem. Let me explain uh, the. So a known signal in noise is coming in. You want to design some receiver so that when you are, when you close the switch at some point, you want to maximize uh, the signal to noise ratio here. That's what we are going to do. So oh, you may say if it is a known signal, why bother? I explained to you the rational. In communication, of course, you know what waveform you are transmitting, but you may not know, of course, you don't know which bit it is modulating. So if you, that's only a change in phase. So if you can uh, detect it, uh, whether it to be uh, the plus waveform or minus waveform properly, uh, then you can uh, figure out uh, the exact signal without any error, even if there is noise, right? That's the whole point of 
uh, digitizing uh, the signal, right? And I did this last week for uh, for you white noise. So what we showed was, uh, remember, I went through all this. We we wrote down the expression for output as and not. So here there is a signal part, and there is a noise part. So I wrote the out expression for the noise uh, signal part, squared it, and then I divided by the average of the output uh, noise power. I'm not going to redo all this. And then I maximize this over this filter. Filter is unknown. And we came with the solution that uh, you flip the waveform and shift it by T naught. That's the optimum solution. And we, in fact, it's a complex conjugate. But if the waveform is real, uh, that's the, so this is the match to filter. Again, uh, this is uh, also there in my lecture notes so 14. No, I'm sorry, for lecture notes 18, 1, 8 on the web. So you can look at that also. Actually, there is a lot more beyond this. So it starts at page uh, 15 and goes on. Right? Now, what, the, what is the problem now? What if this noise is, we did this for uh, white noise. What if this noise is colored noise? So there are a lot of problems where this thing comes up. We can find the solution for white noise easily. And, uh, but the actual noise may have some spectral characteristics. So this all comes up under this, uh, uh, this idea of, Well, uh, this is an idea, uh, I think, uh, introduced by Norbert Wiener. So let me explain to you the... <coughs> so obviously we are talking about Weibson stationary processes. So this is the idea of a whitening filter. Is this possible or not? The idea is that input is a process with some power spectrum, but the, at the output, we want the flat power spectrum. Anybody, what is the relation between the input spectrum and the output spectrum? We went through this last, last week. Anyone? Hello? Is, isn't it just a input? Multiplied by the filter. After after all this, somebody else. Input what? What do you mean by input? So say that again. Uh, uh, listen to what you are saying. Input means what? Input input waveform or input? Hello. What do you mean by input? Is the uh, is the input spectrum multiplied by the um, filter? Oh, what is it? The input spectrum multiplied by the filter. Well, again, I mean, at the very least, uh, you can look at the notes. We uh, how? Why don't you at least review what we have done? Didn't we do it? Well, it's uh, s x x uh, times the square of h. Very good. So that's what. Again, I, I mean, how much uh, sympathy do you expect me to have if you can't even uh, uh, review what we have done last week? So this was the key result. Remember, yes, RYY tau is RXX tau. This we did earlier, convolved with H of tau, convolved with H star of minus tau. So when you do the transform, it becomes the product. The transform of this is SXX omega. The transform of this is H omega. The transform of this is H star omega. So, but you have to go home and do all this stuff. So when you, and transform of this is S Y Y omega. So we are going to exploit this equation. So remember, look at the, you, I heard three different answers. Fortunately, I didn't look at your name, so you don't have to worry. Someone said input multiplied by filter. So that's a very sloppy statement. 
Someone told me input spectrum multiplied by the filter transfer. That's also wrong. Filter. It's a filter transfer function squared, as the last person said. But again, you need to sort of. Uh, so again, let me just warn you about this one. Maybe all of you are feeling good because almost all of you did very well in the first exams. But these are a little more involved. You know, first of all, you can see it uses other areas, Fourier transform, this, that. A little bit of matrix algebra might help you. So trying to do this uh, without any practice is not a good idea. You will not do well. And I am going to remember, most of the bulk is going to come from here. So if you make a lot of mistakes here and your, your GP, I mean, your uh, uh, average, etc. will be, go down, uh, the, the, because you got 90 out of 100 in the first uh, test means nothing here. I've seen people score in 80s, 90s, then do 20s here, because you come without preparation, you see. At least in the probability, you can, once you understand what is going on, a lot of things you can do there uh, yourself. But here, these are hard problems. So I suggest you study a little more before you come into these classes. Same thing with that linear uh, filter. I did, we did a lot. And I'm going to ask you something next week. And remember, if you do that wrongly, you will lose 10 points. So please, uh, please uh, go through the problems, solve them. So look here. We want the output to be flat. So what we are looking for, what we mean by whitening filter is, remember, this is given to us, SXX omega. And we want the output to be flat. Is this possible? So we, and this is what we are looking for. So we get one expression already. So we get h omega squared is 1 over SXX omega, etc. So this itself is a, uh, is a spectrum, right? So the question is, if I am given any spectrum, is it possible to, any spectrum, this is not SX6 omega. Another thing I'm asking is, can you write it like this? So this is, uh, so this is a spectrum, any spectrum. Because one over a spectrum is a spectrum. So let me call it a, so is it possible to write it as the square of a transfer function? Remember, you know what it is, H of omega. So this is the square, absolute square of a transfer function. So let me use a different filter here so that you don't confuse with the E. So is it possible to uh, transfer function G of omega? So if you can, this is, this is what it, so remember this looks like the square root factor you can say, right? Uh, so g of j omega is like the is not exactly but looks like the square root factor. So what does it mean by square root factor? So that is what we mean by spectral factor. If this is possible, this is uh, this is what we mean by spectral factorization. So this is a big topic by itself. There are lots of papers on this topic. If you, the, you can do this in the continuous domain and discrete domain. Again, these are not simple ideas. You can't just, uh, uh, it's not, uh, so there is uh, some amount of theory behind it. So I'm just going to summarize it for you and I am not going to give you an algorithm how to do it. So, the, so what is the problem? Problem is this, given any spectrum, S omega so this is the uh, remember S omega is a non-negative function so you want to write uh, you want you want any spectrum S omega which is obviously positive how to find a filter such that the if the spectrum is the square of the filter transfer function and the second condition is, of course, we want this filter to be useful. So we want this to be stable. 
And uh, sometimes you will see now today that you want the inverse also to be stable. These are the conditions. Uh, you know, stability. If the filter is not stable, you can't implement it, right? And sometimes you need the inverse filter. So, if you, what do you mean by stable? What is that? What do you mean by stable? Yeah, I'm going to tell you the stable, right? Uh, so, is this possible? Okay, so I will. Anybody? Anybody in the audience? What do you mean by a stable filter? Anyone? Anyone, what do you mean by stable filter? I write the two filters here, sort of qualitative. I mean, again, you must have seen this some of, some of this in uh, linear systems and so on ideas. What is a stable filter? Uh, with the boundary input, uh, we, we could have the with boundary output. That's good. So, that's one idea. One idea is that if you if you are putting a, system, a signal here which is bounded, you don't want this output to go like this wild. So this is bounded. Uh, this this look output is if it is going to grow like this, that's going to be wild. This is unbounded. So th then we say the, this is a problem with the filter. This is not a stable filter. We want bounded to give bounded outputs, as he says. Then uh, one one condition is so stable filter. If this is stable, then if you have a bounded input, in other words, an input which is bounded, uh, gives you bounded output, some other bounded output. So obviously that's the quality of the, uh, the condition on the filter is that, remember the filter will have some impulse response, H of T, and you can show that the condition on the filter is that uh, it should be this one. Anybody has studied this? What is this condition called, anyone? Hello? Is it a finite uh, impulse response? Well, it's a little more than that. This says the, the absolute, the, the impulse response should be absolutely convert, convertible, uh, uh, integrable, right? Like uh, abs the uh, impulse response is summable? Like... Yeah, I don't know, not square summable, just summable, absolute value of summable. Just summable. Yeah, so that's the condition for uh, BIBO stability. This is the condition for BIBO stability. BIBO means bounded input, bounded output. So if you have a bounded input signal and if you want the output to be bounded by some value, different value, M here, let's say some value A here. Uh, then, uh, the, of course, the filter should have some property. The property on the filter is its impulse response should be uh, absolutely integrable. Okay, so that's the bounded input, bounded output. So that's what we are requiring here. We are we are saying we want the filter to be nice. We want the inverse of the filter to be nice also. So remember, we need three things. We should be able to find a filter whose square is the given spectrum. And we want the filter to be stable and inverse to be stable. Is this possible? It looks like a lot of conditions. The answer is yes. Question is, is this possible? Answer is yes. And I'll give you, maybe you have seen this. There is a condition. I think log of S omega, this integral should be less than infinity. For uh, such a spectra, this is possible. This is known as Paley Wiener criterion. So I'm going to give you some examples. I am not going to, in the rational case, I will show you how to do it. Uh, professor? Yeah. For stability, we just have to prove that uh, the H of S is just absolute summable, right? Mm -hmm. 
we cannot say if it is bibo stable bibo uh, bibo then it is stable right so that's what i'm necessary and sufficient condition for bibo bibo stability is that the impulse response must be absolutely integral it is necessary and sufficient okay so let's not uh, so let me show you some examples where how, how this is done and with all these three conditions are satisfied so look at this spectrum sxx omega equal to 1 over 1 plus omega squared of course you can see it's a spectrum because it goes like this right it's a butterworth filter non negative and uh, so the first procedure is uh, remember we need to write this as uh, h j omega squared which is h of s h of minus s at s equal to j omega right so i am going to rewrite remember s equal to j omega or if i square it s squared is minus omega squared so i am going the first step is i i should rewrite this also in terms of uh, 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 in terms of yes so that i can i can concentrate here and there so sxx omega when i replace omega squared by minus s squared this reads now 1 minus s squared but of course i can write this as 1 plus s multiplied by 1 minus s but then you can see that if i put this to be hs and this to be h of minus s and uh, uh, you can see here this only has one pole the pole is on the left side so hfs is 1 over 1 plus s is the correct solution because h of t is e raised to minus t it goes dies out and uh, it's obviously it's an integrable function and that's the spectral fact so let me do a different example so you get it this is how i find the spectral of course this is a rational spectrum i'm only going to do examples for rational spectrum if the spectrum is not rational like like this this is a spectrum right how to find uh, fun, whether it is possible for this it is not possible but uh, for non rational spectrum how do you find uh, is it possible to find this or what is the algorithm that's a completely different uh, question but let me do it for Uh, uh, spectrum. So let's look. Look at. Look, I'm. I'm going to make up something else. Or right, let's see whether this is a spectrum. If I draw this at omega equal to zero, I get some value. And uh, and I guess it will go something like this. Uh, you can draw it. So the question is, how do I write this as h of s multiplied by h of minus s? Remember, this minus s is j omega when I put s equal to j omega. So I'm going to replace here omega squared by minus s squared. So let's see, s of minus s squared is minus uh, s squared plus two divided by one plus minus s squared squared, right? So this becomes two minus s squared over one plus s four. So two minus s squared, you know how to transfer. So s of minus s squared is two minus s squared over one plus s four. The question is, how do you trans? Uh, how do you write it as two factors? I want to write it as h s. The other one should look like h of minus s. So I should factor both of these separately. Two minus s squared, of course, I can write it as square root of two plus s multiplied by square root of two minus s. So you can see. This I can put here. This I can put here. That's the idea, right? So it sort of takes care of it. How about one plus s four? So you know uh, this. I think I need to solve this equation, right? S four is minus one. That is e raised to j. S four from here. S four is minus one, right? Minus one is e raised to j pi. Right, e raised to j odd pi, right? So you get uh, the roots are going to be e raised to j two n plus one pi by four. So that will be what pi by four. So these are the four roots. You see, I hope you see that, right? 
So where are these roots? S1. Let's say this root is where? This is 1 plus j by square root of 2, I think, right? You do this because S1 is e raised to j pi by 4. That is cos pi by 4. That is 1 over square root of 2 plus j sine pi by 4. So if this is S1, if this is S2, that's going to be S2 is 1 over square root of 2 minus j 1 over square root of 2. S3 is, uh, so this is 1 minus j by square root of 2. This is minus 1 plus j square root of 2 by divided by square root of 2, minus 1 minus j divided by square root of 2. So S3 is, let me, so let me write this to be S3, this to be S4. So S3 is minus 1 plus j square root of 2. S4 is uh, minus 1 minus j over square root of 2. So you can see if I take these, these two with HFS, I should take these two with HF minus. So let me, uh, HFS is going to be S minus this. So what is it? Uh, S minus S3 multiplied by S minus S4. Let me try that. So that's going to be, so there's some work involved here. So this is going to be s plus square root of half squared plus uh, minus j by 2 square root of 2 the whole square. So if you expand this, s squared plus square root of 2s plus half plus half. So you get this, this factor for h of s with these two factors. So I hope you see this. So we got one factor, h of s multiplied by h of minus s. So that's s squared plus square root of 2 s plus 1. And the other one is s squared minus 2 square root of s plus 1. So this is h of s. This is <coughs> minus h of s. So look at the original problem. I just found the factor of the denominator, right? So now I, I can uh, put uh, this factor for h of s, so which is what I'm going to do. So I can write s of minus s squared as 2 minus s squared over 1 plus s4. So you can see if this is h of s, this is clearly h of minus s. Why is that? Because look at it. I replace s by minus s. So I did it well. Look at where the zeros are, zeros and poles are. Zeros are on the left side, zeros and poles in the left half plane. Left half side. So since the poles are on the left half side, you know this filter is stable. Since the zeros are in the left half plane, you know that the inverse filter also is stable. So I made sure that everything is this, all these three conditions are satisfied. Very good. Look at here, all these three conditions are satisfied. I got a factor, I made the filter stable, I made the inverse stable. Look here, so HFS, so I can write, what was the original thing? Uh, original example was, I just made it up as 2 plus omega squared over 1 plus omega 4. This spectrum is actually the square of this transfer function, s equal to j omega, where h of s is square root of 2 plus s over s squared plus square root of 2 s plus 1. Uh, this filter is stable. If you flip it, you can see the pole is at minus square root of 2. That's also stable. Inverse is stable. So 
this is called spectral factor. So I can give you at some point, maybe in the final exams, a problem like this. I want you to find HFS. So take this problem, see whether you can do it. So it will turn out to be, both will turn out to be Butterworth type filters if you do it correctly. I don't know the coefficients, I just made up. <coughs> You can try to do higher factors here also. So this is a spectrum, you can see. And uh, uh, why don't you try, let me give you two problems. So this is S1, S2 is. So remember, if you plot this, there is a zero here, right? At uh, omega equal to one, but still everything is positive. So question is to find uh, uh, HFS and uh, HF minus S. So find HFS with all these properties. You can do this in the Z domain. In fact, uh, when I teach the course on spectrum estimation and system identification, we go over uh, actual algorithms to... So in other words, the actual real problem is the following. Suppose whatever reason, I draw it by hand a spectrum. I, I don't have any equation, I have a spectrum. So the question is, give me a best approximation of uh, a filter which will fit into this. So this is a good problem. How do you find a filter? So in other words, if you do the solution, it should be very close to the original one. Uh, so this is a big topic, spectral factorization. But for rational functions like this, you can do it by hand. I just picked two examples. And there are some examples in the notes. So please do it. Uh, any questions before I move on on spectral factorization? So I'm going to assume we know how to do the spectral factorization. So what does this mean? So take this problem again. Uh, we have some x of t with some spectrum sxx omega. So I'm, I can assume that there is a spectral factor, whether I know, uh, we know how to find out. When I am looking for a filter such that the output spectrum should be flat. And as I said, we know syy omega is sxx omega multiplied by hj omega squared. And we want this to be one. So I said h of j omega squared should be one over sxx omega. But look at here, one over sxx omega, I can write it as g j omega absolute value squared. So anybody has any idea what will be this filter? Anyone? You should be able to see it now. This is what we are looking for. Hello? This is known, g is known because this spectrum is known. So look at the logic. G is something like this. We'll go through this and we'll find the G. Anybody, how will you find H? H is what we are looking for. We want H to be stable and so on. So what will you, what is a natural choice here? Anyone? One over G. Very good. So we'll to take this to be one over G. See, you can see now, remember G has the property that G is stable and we made sure its inverse is stable. And you can see now, we are using the inverse. So we want this to be stable. And this filter is called the whitening filter. So I hope you see the idea. Whitening filter is a stable filter. It's not a crazy filter. 
it's a stable filter so given any spectrum your first job will be find uh, this filter it's a spectral factor then you flip it you will get the inver uh, that will be the whitening filter so let's go back to this uh, match filter problem <laughs> So you have some signal coming in, but you have noise which is colored now. So both get mixed comes in. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a whitening filter uh, for the noise. So that here the noise looks like this. But because there is a filter, the signal is going to change. I'm going to call it FT. But you have new noise is going to be WT. So SWW omega, we whitened it. So anybody, what will be the, uh, so if I write this noise as uh, GJ omega squared, this is the spectral factor. How, anybody, how will you get HFS? We just went through this. How will you find the whitening filter? If I know the uh, squ the spectral factor for the noise uh, noise spectrum, anyone? Hello? Remember, I want whitening filter in to, to whiten the noise. Forget about the signal. I'm not worried about the signal. I'm just going to only whiten the noise. One over G? Yes, one over G, right. So how will you find, suppose, yes, as I said, suppose this is, 1 over 1 plus uh, omega squared. This is the noise, a low pass noise like this. Then we know G of S, we, I already found out, 1 plus S. That's also a low pass filter, right? Just using a resistance and inductor, a low pass uh, one inductor. And then you flip it, you'll get 1 plus S. So uh, somebody asked me, where is the derivative coming in? You can see here. So HFS is going to be in this example 1 plus S. That means uh, the S is, remember, multiplication by S in the frequency domain is uh, taking a derivative in the time domain. So that's where so this signal needs to be. Uh, so FT is going to be uh, HT convolved with S of T, whatever ST is. Right? So I'm going to leave it like that. I'm going to call this one to be FT, a new waveform in white noise. But we already, so the problem becomes FT plus white noise. That we know, the, if, uh, anybody, what is the best filter if you uh, to use here? We just went through this. Anyone? If you, to maximize the signal to noise ratio, what is the filter we should use here? Hello? Remember in the beginning, late earlier I said white noise. I mean, signal in signal coming in white noise. What is the best filter? Uh, it is S times T zero minus T. Not S F, right? Yes, yes. All right. So you feed this here. So you just have two filters. So I'll I'll summarize it here. If ST is coming in colored noise, first you do the whitening, one over G of S, uh, colored noise SNN, which I'm going to write it as GJ omega squared. And then you do the uh, match filter. So this whole thing is the, uh, this match filter is, so this becomes FT plus WT. Here this noise is white noise. So this is FT naught minus T. And you get the, this is the, uh, so this is the best filter. So, so remember this, always this is the, so in signal processing,
So this is the optimum strategy uh, to which is uh, any questions? So just think about what we just said. If you look at the, even the linear estimation we studied, you will see that that R inverse is doing R inverse half is doing this job, whitening job, followed by match filter. So whitening followed by match filter is the uh, optimum uh, filter. So it is a it is a cascade of two filters. The first job is whitening, then match filtering. You are ma you are not matching to SFT anymore. You are matching to the new signal. Of course, you can put it together and simplify and so on. But conceptually, that is what is in involved. So remember, so this is what is going. If the signal may be like this, by the time this signal comes here, this is your S of T. By the time your FT may be more complicated because of uh, this filter. So this is your F of T here, but and then you flip it. So again, this is S of T. I'm exaggerating, obviously. When you pass through this stage, let's say you get something like this, F of T. Then you have to flip it and shift it. So when you flip it, you get something like this. This is f of minus t. Then when you shift it, you get something like this. f of t naught minus t. So this is t naught. So this is some t. This is some capital t naught, a different length, because this filter will get convolved with this filter. So this length may be different from here. Then you flip it, so this is minus t naught. Then you shift it by uh, so that this zero will go and sit at t naught, whatever is this value. So this value is minus t naught plus t naught. Okay, I hope you see the progression, right? There is more here, but I'm going to stop uh, on match filtering here unless you have some other question. Anybody? Again, this is a very important topic. All the receivers, almost all the receivers in communication theory use this idea. And now I proved it rigorously for you. So of course, if the noise is white, then you don't need you don't need the first step. You don't need to do any whitening because the noise. So remember, we are not whitening the signal. First of all, the signal is a not a stochastic signal, it's just a deterministic waveform, man-made waveform. That's the problem we are looking at. Now, if you want to do stochastic signal in stochastic noise, that's a different problem. That is not what we are doing. And you can see most of the time, uh, what we will, when we say signal is uh, man-made and the signal has some shape. You are, if you are in the, in a military context, if it is your enemy signal, you may not know it. But in communication context, of course, you know the signal. You, everybody knows what is being transmitted by uh, transmit waveforms. What you don't know is what is the uh, sequence and this and that, right? Any questions? Uh, tell me yes or no. I want to move on. Any any questions, anyone? Uh, professor. Yeah. Uh, in this process, after the whitening filter, the color noise became the became the white noise. So what happened to the signal? I mean, here the ST be becomes the FT. Uh, what is changed here? Yeah, look at here. The signal is ST will become something else, FT. How do you get FT from ST? Anybody? How do you get FT from ST? Look at here. What is the between FT and ST? 
Hello. Any filter? Yeah, another filter. So think of it as uh, think of its inverse transform is some waveform. I'm going to call it L of t. So you can work this with this to get this, right? Yes. Is that clear? Yes, yes. I told you here, look at here. ST, FT is ST convolved with L of T. L of T is the inverse transform of 1 over G of uh, G omega. Okay? Okay, okay. Got it. Thank you. So if the noise is white, you don't have to worry about whitening. Okay? Yes? What? Sorry? If the noise is already white, then you don't need to whiten, right? Sure. Yeah. So in the notes, I have more problem. So the problem here may be, so look at this problem. So if, if the noise is white, then we know we use the match filter here, which is S of T naught minus T. And if you remember, the maximum value of the output SNR last time, I think I showed you, is 1 over sigma squared 0 to T naught of S squared T dt. I'm sorry, if ST is, uh, maybe this waveform I think is here, S hat of T. Yeah, I mean, this is fine. So, Now, usually ST is coming through a channel with some impulse response Q of T. And you are transmitting some waveform, let's say A of T. This is where the freedom is. You have freedom here. So this is the question I am not going to answer. I just wanted to, usually you have some channel with some response. So this is why the wireless people go and measure the channel response. This is the channel response. So you transmit some signal that comes through the channel that gets that gets added to noise. Then we know match filter is the best one. But uh, this signal is coming through the channel. So the question is, this is what you are uh, transmitting. This is the transmit signal. Can you do something here? What shape do you use here so that to optimize the output signal to noise ratio? This is there in the notes. If I have time later, I will come back. I think we have two more lectures. Uh, let me see how to, I want next week, I wanted to, at least one lecture I want to do on Markov chains and so on. And, uh, but we have a little more to do here. So anyway, that's a, pro that's a, uh, uh, that's a problem beyond this. So I hope you understand the problem. You transmit something, uh, let's, uh, let me call it uh, F of T, that goes through a channel. Remember, channel is what it is. Channel has a response Q of T, some response in time domain. That gives you S of T. And here you add noise gets added. Let's say white noise. And then you do, you know, the best filter to use is the match filter, which is S of T naught minus T. 
and you will have some output will be peaking at uh, this point at a T naught. So the maximum signal to maximum value of the SNR output is actually one over sigma squared zero to T naught of ST squared DT. But we want to maximize this again because suppose you say that you have freedom here, I can take any shape I want at the input. So I have freedom here. Remember, this is your actual transmit signal. This is not the transmit signal. This is coming through the channel. And then this is the channel output. So if I suddenly write it in discrete case, this will be SN will be, remember, this will be QN convolved. We can do both together, convolved with FN, right? This output will be this convolved with this. So that's going to be uh, sigma Q N minus K multiplied by F K on K. So the maximum SNR is this one. So maximum SNR, I'll just do one quick case, is uh, 1 over sigma squared sigma Sn squared, whatever is on n, Sn is the output. Now let me substitute for Sn uh, this expression. So this is 1 over sigma squared summation on n, summation on Fn minus k, I'm sorry, Qn minus k, or multiplied by Fk, absolute value squared. So this is going to be one over sigma squared summation on n. Here you have two summation, q n minus k, k f k on k, and I have q star n minus m, f star m. So I'm going to one. I'm going to rearrange the summations here. One over sigma squared summation k summation m and the summation n. So n is this one, q n minus k, q m minus n minus m star. And then I have uh, f k, f m star. So notice this if I call to be a matrix of a n comma, I'm sorry, k comma M. Then this whole thing you just have to go home and do uh, do it. I can write this as f star a f. Again, some matrix algebra will come up because this is double summation f k star f m star. And this is what I'm going. I'm calling. This is I'm just writing it as f k. Anybody? A is a positive definite matrix that you have to show also. So anybody has any idea how to, well, what will you do? I want to, this maximization is on F, the transmit signal. So how will, F is free here. A is on the channel. Look at here. A is a prop, so this maximum output turns out to be F star A F. This is the transmit signal. This is the channel properties, but A is a non-negative matrix. So the question is, how do you pick up F? Anyone? How do you maximize this quantity? I want to maximize this. This matrix is given because channel is given. So you can compute Aij is going to be summation Q I minus K, Q star J minus K. I'm just copying from here. So we can compute this matrix if I give you the channel. Anybody has an idea? We went through this. How do you maximize this? If A is a positive definite matrix, how do you maximize F transpose AF? Anyone? Take derivatives. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you, I, can, uh, I think it's eigenvalue. Eigen yeah, very good. Okay. So you see, all of you are weak. You should read some, you're all graduate students. As I said, learn a simple little bit of linear algebra. 
So I think I went through this, right? A f equal to lambda f. If this is an eigen, if this is an eigen value, eigen vector, a f one equal to lambda one f one. So if I multiply by the same f one star, this becomes lambda one f one absolute value squared. You want to maximize this, then you can clearly say that lambda. This is uh, yeah, you should lambda f one actually well, all the eigen vectors you can make it unit length. So this length is one. So this turns out to be lambda one. So you want the maximum eigen value. You want the eigen vector correspond to the maximum eigen value. Is the solution lambda max? So this must be f must be. So a little bit matrix algebra, you can learn a lot, or you can do some research and to the maximum eigen value of uh, a. But a is channel. It makes sense, right? The transmit waveform should be selected depending on the channel. A is a non-negative definite matrix. So transmit signal. See again, all these are new results that you didn't know, and that's the whole point of coming into this class. Any questions? Did you see what I'm trying to say? Anyone? So here the F1 vector has to be an eigenvector. Why can't it just be any other vector? Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. Look at here. Let's take a different problem. A matrix has got uh, eigenvalues lambda 1, F1. A, F2 is uh, lambda 2, F2. Etc. A matrix will have n eigenvalues uh, in this best case. Let's say all of them are. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but uh, you can uh, for each eigenvalue. If it is n by n, there will be n eigenvalues. That all the I don't know whether you remember any of this. If A is a positive definite matrix, on when we discussed the eigenvalues, I showed you that all the eigenvalues will be positive. Do you remember that? So the problem, uh, yes. Yeah, problem yeah. is you, you guys don't go and review anything. I, think. I mean, I don't want to blame you all. But anyway, you can see that on the both the sides, if I divide by the any constant, it won't make any difference. So I can choose this vector to be unit length always, right? You see that? Because I just divide by the length of the vector. It makes no difference. So we will assume that all the eigenvectors are of unit length. There is no problem. And then look at it. I, let me do F transpose A F I. F I is one of. So I'll get lambda A, A, A F I is lambda I F I. So I get lambda I F I transpose F. But this is unit length. We just said this. So this is simply lambda I. So how do I maximize this quantity? Anybody? I want to maximize this. Which eigenvector should I choose? This quantity is equal to lambda i. So which eigenvector should I choose to maximize this quantity? The maximum of the eigenvalue. All right, so this is a theorem. If you want to maximize x transpose ax, if you want to maximize this, obviously choose, uh, if this is, whatever is the, if these are all arranged in uh, increasing order, then choose the maximum eigenvalue, obviously. So this should be the eigenvector corresponding to lambda max. That's the solution. So this is where the matrix algebra helps. Look at your problem. You, you, got, you wanted to maximize this quantity. So immediately we know that F should be corresponding to the largest eigenvector, uh, eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of capital A. That's a nonlinear solution, and that is the correct solution. 
Well, so uh, this is why I said little bit of algebra will help you. And if you don't know anything, then how will you proceed? And moreover, this is a graduate course. Some of you may go into research. Anyway, the research or not, when you are in a course, you should learn what is expected of that uh, course. Any other questions? Any questions? Hello? Uh, talk to me, please. Anybody has any questions or not? I'm just reviewing the proof of this. Yeah, Sorry. but uh, that's fine. But you should, uh, the whole point is you should also review it after the class, right? So somehow, I mean, for all this, for these things to appreciate and understand, you need a little bit of matrix algebra about positive definite matrices. It's time to learn. Of that good stuff. In fact, I went over the we went over that with you guys a couple of weeks back on a Saturday. So this is a standard problem. Anybody? Uh, a is a positive matrix. I look at this. Uh, this is a scalar quantity. How do you maximize it? How do you minimize it? Anybody? What's the answer? Which vector will maximize this quantity? Which vector will minimize this quantity? Anyone? Let's say the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are fi and lambda i, and lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. are arranged in increasing order. All of them are positive. So, what is the solution? Anyone? The corresponding eigenvector of the maximum uh, eigenvalue. Is the will maximize? How will you minimize this? The minimum. Yeah, but again, these are very standard things, and you can see you should be able to see the proof. The whole idea is that x transpose a x is a lambda multiplied by f. Uh, just a, 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 if you, it's a lambda i. So obviously. Lambda 1 will maximize it, lambda n will minimize it. Okay, so let me move on to Anybody has heard about Hilbert transform? Anyone? Hello? It's a convolutions of one of a, uh, one of a pi t. So let me talk about, I'll bring in the stochastic signal later. I have a signal Ft. What be Hil uh, by Hilbert transform is actually, I'll write it in words, 90 degree phase shift in frequency domain. So if this has a transform, if this is H of T and H omega, the, uh, this is the filter, right? This is the filter. So I'm going to describe the filter.
remember this is the sine function and y so j is of course you know j is e raised to j pi by 2 so you can see in the frequency domain you are pushing the only the phase by either pi by 2 or minus pi by 2 right? so this is the this is the sine function and this is the filter here so the question is what is its impulse response so i'm going to let's solve this first and then we'll see what is single side band and so on okay so this is an application again you can see what i am doing i'm doing different pro you are in a position now to uh, analyze different problems we already addressed one big problem which was matched filter for the best receiver design all the radars use match filter all the submarines use match filter most of the communication is match filter when i say match filter if the noise is not white you whiten it so the rest is all details so you can see the thing you learned about today so the you'll see i'll i'll explain to you what is single sideband modulation and maybe you know this already so anyway let me or maybe let's go to that one so if you have a a stochastic signal with uh, xft with the power spectrum sxx omega it has got some bandwidth this is the double sided bandwidth anybody has an idea what happens if i modulate that signal what if i transmit x of t cos omega not t plus phi so what i am doing is this is amplitude modulation am right because the signal is being modulated to a carrier uh, we remember this is a problem we went through this anybody has any idea what is the uh, autocorrelation function of the output signal you can do it mentally now but we went through this couple of examples what's the autocorrelation function of the output if this is why it's in stationary hello this is not that hard anyone remember how it goes you do r y y t 1 y t 2 x of t is uh, then you do the simplification so it will be this you go home i, I you have done it it's many times so anybody what is the spectrum now if uh, what is the spectrum of the output anyone it's convolutions all right, so what do you get? Um, it's X, X convolution. Oh, if you convert the spectrum with the cos omega naught to, what do you get? Uh, omega, omega, minus, omega, omega. Pro, o, omega plus omega zero minus plus. Omega minus omega zero. So you see this spectrum becomes like this. This is SYY omega. Here you can see the information is, good information is only here on this side so you can see the information is duplicated on both unnecessarily so so much bandwidth is taken so single sideband modulation is asking for is it possible to just to transmit this or the other one is it possible to find a signal so this is single sideband so i'm going to show you that hilbert transform can do this here you are wasting bandwidth. You see, a lot of bandwidth is wasted. Here, so th this is 2B not wasted on both the sides. Here you are only using, the, this is upper single side band, <coughs> USB. And uh, you do the other one, that will be the lower single side band, right? So this is the lower single side band. This are, that is the upper one. So question is, can you do this? How do you do this? This is in the frequency domain. So this is where, with a stochastic signal. So that's where the Hilbert transform I'm going to show you is useful.
So let, let me see whether I remember this. So h of j omega is uh, minus j sine omega. So I'm going to add uh, 1 plus j h omega. Let's look at this. So 1 plus, uh, remember, this will become j squared. j squared is minus 1. So this will become 1 plus sine omega, right? What is 1 plus sine omega? Sine omega is like this. This is sine omega. If you add 1 to it, what do you get? Anybody? Oh, yeah. The function times. Yeah, 2 u omega. u omega is like this, unit step. Okay. Now I'm going to take the derivative on both the sides. So I get h prime j omega. What's the derivative of u? Anybody? Theta function. All right, very good. So you get this expression. Now I'm going to do the inverse transform. So remember, what is the uh, derivative? What is the transform of a delta function? Anybody remembers? Constant. All right, that's constant. So, what is the if you bring in the constant here in the time domain? What's the transform here? You remember two pi multiplied by delta omega. You know how the, you get this. So let me go to that. So suppose ft has a transform of f omega f omega is minus infinity to plus infinity ft e raised to minus j omega t dt. I'm going to rewrite this uh, variable uh, small f to something else. Let's say I change it to v. So e raised to minus j omega v dv. And this is still f omega. And I'm going to change the omega to something else here. Let's say I'm going to change it to t. Then this expression becomes f of v e raised to minus j. Remember, omega is changed to t dv. So that's still good. Now this is a dummy variable. So I'm going to change it to something else, the v. I'm going to replace it by, let's say, omega. Then I get uh, like this. So it's almost like the inverse Fourier transform. So I'm going to write this as 1 over 2 pi minus infinity plus infinity I multiply by 2 pi f omega e raised to minus j omega t d omega, d omega. See, if this was plus here, I could have written it as inverse. So I'm going to replace omega by minus omega. So this will become plus. This will become minus d omega. Limits will flip back. So you see that this is the transform of this function. So remember this expression. If ft has a transform f omega, then uh, capital ft has a transform of 2 pi f of minus omega. So I used that here. Now what is the transform of h prime omega? Look here. So take the, we have f omega equal to minus infinity to plus infinity ft e raised to minus j omega t dt. Take the derivative, so I get f prime omega with respect to omega on both the sides. So you get minus jt ft e raised to minus j omega t dt. So this must be the transform of f prime omega. What I'm trying to say, you see here, right? So minus jt ft is the transform of f prime omega. Okay, so I'm going to use that result also. These results should be at your fingertip. At least you should be able to derive it. So look here. H prime omega's inverse transform from here. H prime omega's inverse transform is, so I have a j here, but so the inverse transform of h prime omega, I hope you see it from here, right? Is minus j t h of t equals the inverse transform of this, I, I have it here. Inverse transform of uh, uh, 2 pi j omega is this one. So I go cancel by, by pi. So this is going to be 1 over pi of 2 of the j omega is this function. All this is in the time domain. 
See, j squared is minus one, minus one goes away. So as somebody said, uh, the, in, the impulse response of a Hilbert transform filter is just this. Very simple. That's what I first wanted to do right. So look, you do this fancy stuff in the frequency domain. There is no magnitude here. You're only shifting the phase. Positive frequencies, you shift the phase by 90 degrees. Negative frequencies, you shift it by minus 90. So it's just a 90 degree phase shifter. So the impulse response is 1 over pi t. So if you have a waveform ft and you pass it through 1 over pi t, I'm going to call the output, we are going to use this notation. So we will call this operation to be Hilbert transform. In frequency domain, you should remember this is minus j sine omega, 90 degree phase shift. Now I'm going to apply a stochastic process to the input, to this filter. So this is Hilbert transform. This is x of t. I'm going to call the output to be x hat of t. This is not derivative, but Hilbert transform. So let's find out the mean and I mean, uh, so this is a Whiteson stationary process. So it has got a spectrum like this, Sx, x omega. Let's find out the output spectrum. So the cross autocorrelation function is, remember, it's a linear filter with some impulse response h of t. So the, out, the cross correlation function is Rxx tau convolved with uh, h, h star of minus tau. So that's going to be Rxx tau uh, Rxx uh, u, here you have tau, uh, tau plus u du, right? That's what h, h star, 1 over pi. And then Rx star x star tau would be Rxx tau convolved with h of tau convolved with h star of minus tau. So s x, x hat omega is SXX omega multiplied by, what was it? H star of omega, right? So let me write down in the next one. Yes, you need this to, so I'm going to give you a problem to solve at home. Look at here, H omega is here. So H star omega will be J sine omega. So that's a complex thing. But look at the output spectrum. Anybody, what will be the output spectrum? Anyone? What will be the value of this? H is here. H is minus J sine omega. So what will be the absolute value squared of that? Hello? Anybody there? I see 53 students, so somebody should be able to answer. What is the absolute value squared of this? <coughs> One. One, right. So what happens to the output spectrum? Output spectrum is the same as? <coughs> so do you see these two properties? Once you pass a stochastic process through a Hilbert transform, the cross spectrum is given by this expression, and the output spectrum is same as the input spectrum. So you can say the output autocorrelation is the same as input autocorrelation from the last expression. All right, now what is the problem? So remember these two expressions. I want you to use this and do something at home. And because the problems like this come up in the exam. So,
So remember, I said uh, here I talked about AM, right? Amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation is you are just modulating the amplitude of a carrier by X of T. Uh, then you end up with a, a spectrum on both this. Uh, you end up with a double the bandwidth. The question is, can you save the bandwidth and bring it to this fashion? And this is where the Hilbert transform is going to help you. So you need to go home. I'm not going to do it completely. This is an exam problem. Usually this is an exam problem. So X, uh, X of T is Whiteson stationary. Remember, if I do it, then there is nothing in it. Right? So I, the question is find R, Y, Y, T1, gamma, T2. So the question is, is this Whiteson stationary? So you have to answer yes or no. Find its power spectrum. So this is now you can do, uh, this is something doable by you. So let's say SXX Omega is like this. I want you to draw the shape of, uh, so I want you to, so this is a, if it's an exam problem, then you should be able to do it. You're actually in a position to do this problem. Uh, you have everything, you see, you have Y of T, for each term, you know how to find the, uh, you know the cross correlation of the, this, you know the autocorrelation of the, this, and uh, so find the autocorrelation function of this, then take the Fourier transform and use these relations, and uh, you have to do some simplifying, then you will be able to draw this picture in terms of this picture. So this picture has got two parts. This part is of course identical to this part because just a, a symmetric waveform. So the, all the information is just here. So see what the picture you get here. Remember, this is a real signal. That's why the spectrum is symmetric and so on. Right? So this has got interesting practical applications, what I just did. Any questions? All right. So here the phi is, uh, phi is uniform in 0 to 2 pi. And this, this is a random phase, independent of this. So you have two, two randomness. One is in the phase, one is here. This is a stochastic process, which is why it's in stationary. Right? But you are modulating using two terms. Remember, in amplitude modulation, you only have one term. So this is the way it comes, right? So you have cos omega naught t here. You have uh, you have Hilbert transform here. Then you have sine omega naught t here. So x of t, and uh, then you are adding these two, and that goes. And then a random phase comes in as it goes throughout. And that's what you are receiving. So if you add the second side with the Hilbert transform and sine omega naught t, what happens to the spectrum? <coughs> so find the autocorrelation function and then find the So remember, uh, again, I, I hate to do this because I'm not doing you any help by doing this myself. So what I want you to do is go home and do this. Uh, first of all, I want to show you, I want you to show that this is uh, this will come as a white sun stationary process. First, but you have to simplify. There will be four terms expanded, etc. Then you take the Fourier transform of that, and then arrange all the terms. Use uh, these properties. You will need these two properties. 
when you have the spectrum like this, you use this one. Then you draw the pictures and add and subtract and see how the spectrum will come, overall spectrum will come up. Okay, so that's the, that's your job. And of course, this is easy to implement. In time domain, you just convolve with 1 over pi t, as somebody said. Because I found that impulse response for you. Any questions? Anybody? So when you do this, of course, you will get the four terms, right? One. So you substitute this here also, I mean, everything into here and here with the T1 replaced by T2 expected value there will be four terms, so, so simplify and then expand uh, cosine A, cosine B, you know how to expand it, sine A, sine B, collect the terms, also use this property, right, so, and you have, uh, you also have some other properties, right, so what did I, what did we prove, we had uh, SXX, Omega is SXX. I mean, SX hat omega is this multiplied by H star J omega. So that turns out to be, it will J sine omega uh, SXX omega. And you can relate, and you also should find out X hat omega. So this I I'm sorry, yeah, X hat S. This I believe is just a, a, a minus of S X hat omega. I think you need to check it. So if that is the case, you get the property that this is minus R X X hat, because you need this expression also. Maybe there's a minus sign here, but check this out. So all these relations need to go in here to simplify, this will turn out to be white stationary, and then the rest I won't tell you. You just read the do the transform correctly. So the, uh, this needs work at home. Please uh, do the work. Let me do one more application. So that, that's a phase modulation, right? Or frequency modulation. Uh, yeah. Oh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying both are okay because if it is frequency modulation, uh, the uh, instantaneous frequencies, um, uh, frequency is what? Omega naught plus uh, X prime T. So you want this to be proportional to the message. So F, X of T will be integral of M tau D tau. Right? So in that case, it will be, a X, if it is frequency modulation, uh, then of course, uh, frequency, instantaneous frequency should be proportional to the message. If it is phase modulation, this is message itself. Anyway, so let's, uh, this is why it's stationary signal. Question is, uh, what about YFT? So you can see, anybody, what is the mean of zero? Mean of YFT, anybody? Hello? So this is, if you expand, this will be cos P, 
or minus cos uh, sine omega naught t plus x of t sine phi. But uh, these two are independent, so expectation comes here, expectation comes here. This is zero, this is zero, so the mean is zero. Hifeng, are you there? So how about the autocorrelation function? Anyone? So let's look at the autocorrelation function, expected value of uh, y t1, y, remember everything is real here, so that's going to be expected value of cosine of omega naught t1 plus x t1 uh, plus phi multiplied by cosine of omega naught t2 plus x of t2 plus phi. You need to multiply these two. So this is cos A cos B. So that's going to be half of expected value of two terms, right? Cosine of omega naught T2 minus T1 plus X of T2, A plus B plus A minus B, right? So this is A minus B, I wrote it. The other one is going to be omega naught plus T1 plus T2 plus X of uh, T2, X T1 plus X T2 plus 2 phi. So anybody has any idea how do you, what will be the expected value of this term? So let me call this whole thing to be A. So this again you can expand cos A, cos B, expected value. So expected value here, expected value here. This is expected value of sine A, expected value of sine 2 phi, 2 phi. But uh, this is the same argument again, because this is going to be cosine of 2 phi, 1 over 2 pi d phi, 0 to 2 pi or sign here, both are zero. So this term expected value is zero. So R Y Y T1 comma T2 is just expected value is only here. So I can write this as expected value of cos omega naught tau plus X T2 minus X T1. To make it simple, let me call this Y. Oh, there's an expected value here. So that's what we need to simplify. So that becomes, uh, so R Y Y T1 comma T2 reduces to half expected value of cos omega naught tau plus Y, where Y is X of T2 minus X of T1. So what do we do? Uh, we have to find the expected value. So I'm going to expand this. So R Y Y T1 gamma T2 is half uh, cosine omega naught tau expected value of cos Y minus half sine omega naught tau because that's where the expectation is. Expected value of sine Y. So Y X is here. So you need to simplified this, but you can see if X of T is wide and stationary, 
you can already see this is why it's stationary, right? Because expect uh, we want the I remember this is just a random variable. This is the difference of these two random variables. Now I am going to make this to make further. Otherwise, you need to do it, and you need to find the density function of y, etc. So let's do this case uh, with autocorrelation function r x x tau. Suppose x of t is stationary Gaussian, then we can simplify this. Anybody, if x of t is stationary Gaussian, what uh, what about each of these random variables? Anyone? You need to help me here. X of t1 and x of t2, they are what? Hello? There's zero mean and... Um... Gaussian, right? Gaussian, yeah, right. So the mean, mean may be constant, but it's the same constant. So the mean of y is zero. So the question is, what will be the variance of y? Y is Gaussian. Then y is Gaussian. Actually, zero mean Gaussian. So let's find out its variance. So variance of y, I'm going to call this sigma y squared. Is, the mean is uh, uh, zero, so this is simply xt2 minus xt1. Remember, this is something you can do now. I am just doing simple things. So if you expand it, you get xt squared plus x1 squared minus two expected value of xt1, xt2. Anybody, what is what is this values in terms of rxx? What is this in terms of Rxx, the first two terms? Rx0. This is expected value of x squared t1 is Rxx tau? Zero. Zero, zero. Mm -hmm. All right, the second term is Rxx0, Rxx tau. And we know the maximum values at the origin, so this quantity is positive. So this is sigma y squared. Now, anybody, so we want the expected value of cos y y is gaussian so y is gaussian with the uh, y is gaussian with the zero mean and variance sigma y squared anybody what is the how do you find expected value of cos y and sin y anyone any ideas you expand it into its exponential form or, uh, yeah, that is correct, but we can uh, try to think of something we have studied. We have studied a function. Uh, we have studied a function which will be useful here. Which is the real part of characteristic from... Yeah, so this is the real part. This is the imaginary part of the characteristic. This is where the characteristic function helps you. Characteristic function is e raised to j omega y. So characteristic function evaluated at 1 is e raised to j y, but that is e raised to j y is cos y plus j e raised to sine y. Right? So you can find out each one of this. What is the characteristic function of a Gaussian? Anybody? I mean y. So y is Gaussian. Look at here. Y is this is how you connect everything. Y is Gaussian with the zero mean and variance sigma y squared. So what is the characteristic function of Gaussian? Well, sine y is just odd, so shouldn't it? Be yeah, yeah, we'll come, to, we'll come to that, but let's see the Ga Gaussian. You are right. What is the characteristic function of Gaussian? E to the omega square, sigma square over two. That's going to be, here remember, in my case, I only need phi y of one. So omega is one. Omega squared by two is rxx zero minus rxx tau. You are right. This is real, purely real. So this term is zero because it is odd. So we get expected value of cos y. You don't have to do any job. You just got the answer. It's all equal to this. So we solved this one. We wanted, where is it? Uh, yeah, so we came out to here. So 
we wanted e raised to cos y r y y tau so we have the answer so let me write it down so r y y t1 comma t2 turns out to be what does it half half cosine omega not tau uh, then e to the power minus rx x zero minus rx x tau. Look at the right side. There is only tau. At this point, I can conclude that this is also y x and stationary. So I'll write this as r y y tau is e raised to minus uh, r x x zero minus r x x tau. and uh, cos omega not tau. So what is the spectrum? So you know that this is why it's on stationary, R, Y, Y, I meant. So we just proved that if the modulating signal is Gaussian, then the FM is why it's on stationary. And it's a, uh, you can write this if you want, R, X, X, zero, multiplied by E raised to minus R, R X X tau. Right? So you need to find the transform of this, which is uh, you can assume some uh, form, and then it may be easy. So that sort of uh, that's the so why don't you go, why don't you redo this problem where X of T is a Wiener process? and see what you get for the spectrum of FM modulus. So this is my, this is the problem for you. Almost uh, here. Remember, Wiener process is Gaussian. So, and it's a, it's a non-stationary, but still uh, see what comes up here. So it's uh, autocorrelation function is, anybody remembers what's the autocorrelation function? Minimum of T1 and T2. All right, so plug it in this. Uh, sometimes I give this as a final problem. So you can see these problems are very hard to solve if you have never practiced anything. So try to, uh, so, uh, so there are only, uh, I will give problems from what I am teaching, all the concepts that, so Hilbert transform, now problems like this, match filter, uh, finding the Fourier transform of an autocorrelation function. But none of this you will be able to do without practicing at home. That's what I'm trying to say. You can say, oh, I know everything, everything is fine, etc., etc. So don't be surprised if you are not doing any job. Those who made 90 will end up scoring 20 in final exams. So I want to keep all the 90s as 90s and get you through a good with a good grade. That's my goal. So things like this. And actually one of the homework problems uh, is going to be in the final exam. There was a problem like this last year and you will see it in your homework. So this year it is much simpler. I'm breaking up the exams one problem at a time. So, Hefeng, are you there? 